Okay. All right. Thank you. Listen, I'm glad to be back here. Um, you know, today uh, I kind of walked around to some places in uh, on campus that I'd never been before. I went into the prayer room uh, for a few minutes. And, uh, and then I walked out of the prayer room and was just walking through a hallway at a school and heard somebody at the other end of the hallway singing, uh, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And, uh, and I couldn't help but wonder if you guys understand how rare it is that I would walk around a college campus anywhere in the world and hear of all things that I would overhear somebody saying, worthy, singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. They didn't know that I was there. They weren't doing it to impress me. Uh, and, and I don't know if you understand that uh, as somebody that spends a lot of time off of the Christ for the Nations campus, let me just assure you. Uh, that's a rare thing. You guys have something really special here. I'm curious. Uh, first year students, are you guys glad you came? Good. I'm glad you came too. Thank you guys. Uh, are, are you guys excited about what this summer holds for you? I know some of you are doing internships, some are going overseas. Uh, listen, I believe that you are significantly more equipped to carry out the, the tasks the Lord has given you than you were last year. Uh, and, and I don't know, I know that it's seemed like a lot of homework to you and seemed like a lot of busy work to you, but, uh, uh I, I want you to understand that it's about to pay off big time. You're about to know exactly what to do. You're, you're about to be a hundred percent clear on what it is the Lord has called you to do and how it is he's called you to do it. Uh, and so I, I want to just reassure you and, and hopefully today to hope to, to, to hope to stoke a flame in you, uh, regarding where you're about to go. I know that it's, it's almost the end of the year. Uh, and I'm not going to preach for too long uh, tonight, but I want you to, to stay with me uh, because what I have to share today um, is, uh, in my opinion, the most significant thing I've ever preached in my entire life. Uh, never in my life, I, uh, I was telling Blake backstage, never in my life have I sat while preparing a, a sermon and just looked at my notes with tears running down my face until last night as I was preparing for this. Uh, and today is uh, today's the seventh day uh, of, of uh, a week in which I, I've preached seven times. This is the seventh sermon I've, I've preached in the last seven days. And uh, and it's been it's been mighty. It's been incredible. We've seen hundreds of people get saved, people get restored and and delivered by the power of God. But I want to tell you, uh, there is something about tonight. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is something about tonight. Uh, I believe that there are going to be people here um, I think that if you really hear what I'm saying to you, I think there are going to be people here that really uh, second guess whether or not they were called to ministry. And I think that's going to be a good thing. I think there are going to be people here that, that you thought uh, you were going to be a cool youth minister and you were going to grow out a nice goatee and listen to all the, all the hot Christian bands and you were going to hang out with your youth group kids just like you did when you were in high school. But now you're going to get paid to do it. And I think that God is going to bring a, a rude awakening tonight. Uh, because I'm not, listen, I'm not preaching about cool youth pastors tonight. I'm not preaching about being popular tonight. I'm not preaching about being in a relevant church. I preached at a, at a mega church recently, uh, that had a ridiculous light system uh, or a ridiculous light set up. And I said, man, look at those lights. Those are awesome. And the guy turned to me and said, yeah, we do, we do our best to stay relevant. <laughs> uh, now, I'm not going to go too far on that rabbit trail, but I want to tell you that what, what is the line between relevance and irrelevance is not lights. It's not, it's not production. It's not your sound quality. The thing that makes you relevant is if you have what people are looking for, and his name is Jesus. Mm. So, uh, so what I think uh, is going to happen tonight is, is that people are going to get, a, a, hopefully by, by the hope of the Holy Spirit, and this is nothing that I could ever, I can never preach you into this revelation, uh, but I think uh, that, that tonight I've, I've been assigned to help give you a clearer picture of the cross than maybe you've ever had, a clearer picture of the cross than maybe you've ever had before. And, and listen, I'm not preaching the prophetic application of the cross. I'm not preaching the cross as a fulfillment of, of Jewish custom or, 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 or Old Testament prophecy. I'm not preaching uh, the, the spiritual implications of the, pro the cross. I'm preaching the cross. And, uh, and listen, we're, we're going to get there. But um, one thing that, uh, that happens uh, pretty regularly because of the kind of music that my band plays 
uh, is, is, you know, we get told, well, you guys are, are really, you know, you're, you're kind of a darker band and your music is dark. It's intense. It's aggressive. Uh, you know, you have, you wear black when you're on stage and, you know, some of you, we just came out with a, an album recently that just had a picture of Jesus face on it. And he had a, eyes that burn like, like flames of fire and he had a beard and his face was dirty and bloody and, uh, and he had a crown of thorns on his head and people asked, uh, you know, how that's not that the people said, that's not Christian. That's not what Jesus, that looks scary. That's not what Jesus looked like. Uh, and I said, well, apparently I need to preach the cross sometime soon because you've been very misinformed. If you think, if you think that everything about the Christian life is comfortable and everything about the Christian life is easy and it's all bunny rabbits and rainbows all the time. So, so tonight I'm, I'm preaching the cross and, and the title of this sermon, uh, and, and I think that it's the most appropriate title I could have come up with is, is uh, the glorious dishonor of the cross. The glorious dishonor of the cross. I don't want you to think when, when I get done today and, and uh, I kind of got a lot of notes, so I'm going to fly. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to this because I want you to do business with God tonight. And I want you to set your heart right now uh, to, to get out of your head that this is going to be uh, this is just going to be another fun TNE and I'm going to wait till nine o'clock and then I'm going to go swipe my card and get out of here and go home because I got better things to do. I want you right now to understand that that something could happen today that could mark your ministry for the rest of your life. Something could happen today that could help to define and direct the course of your life. Every conversation you have, every thought you think, every day that you wake up and, and choose whether or not you're going to serve the Lord that day. Uh, I believe that this could be the moment in which you begin to understand what that really means and what that's really going to look like. So you can make an informed decision. I know that we all love to show up to church and the Holy Ghost fills the room and it feels good and we get goosebumps and cry a few tears and come up to the altar and, and leave there with our arms around our best friend talking about how powerful that night was. But I want you to understand it's not like that all the time. It's not always dignified. This isn't a youth, this isn't a youth camp where I'm trying to get you fired up. I want you to understand what you've signed up for. So I'm preaching the cross tonight. I see a, uh, a great misconception in our modern church culture regarding the way we approach sacrifice in light of the way Jesus approached it and the way we approach ministry in light of the way Jesus ap approached it. Tonight, I want to help you see the cross for real. I'm not going to make it dramatic or doll it up. This isn't going to be Hollywood's interpretation or some poetic metaphor about the suffering we think Christ may have endured. This is not prophetic or symbolic. I want to go to scripture and help you to really take in the harsh, explicit reality of the cross. If someone would have had a television camera at the cross, we wouldn't show it on, on cable. We wouldn't take our youth group kids there to come and see it and maybe cry a few tears and say, man, I can't believe Jesus did that for me. That, that made me feel really bad about myself. I want you to understand that, that what you would have seen and what would have assaulted your senses during the time that the, 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 the savior of the universe was hanging on that cross would have been so grotesque and so vile and so utterly uh, uh, unappealing that, that nobody... Nobody in their right mind would ever have said, I want to follow that man. Nobody in their right mind would have said, that's, that's my king. I want to identify with that man. That is why it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. That is why it is a miracle every single time a sinner decides to come to the cross to lay their sin down. That's, listen, no amount of good preaching or good music or good light shows or good, good church programs is ever going to be able to convince a sinner to truly embrace the cross. We may, listen, we may pervert the cross and we may hang a little cartoon Jesus up there looking like he's having the time of his life. And we may convince people to come up to the front of our church and, and say a prayer and cry some tears. But if they really saw the cross, anybody uh, that had not been, been, been supernaturally regenerated by the, the power of the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit, anybody in their right mind would turn around and run the other way. So I, I believe with all of my heart that there are going to be people that, that listen to this sermon and have to take a second look at whether or not they want to enter the ministry. I think there are going to be people that, that look at this sermon and say, I don't know if I want anything to do with that because that is not appealing. 
So I pray, let, let me just, let me pray real quick. Father, I pray right now that, that by your Holy Spirit that you would uh, open the eyes uh, uh, of, ev of everyone in this room and everybody watching online, Father. I pray that, that by the power of your Holy Ghost, Father, that, that you would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, God, that, uh, that you would cause them to be able to see you for who you are, not to see you for who the church says you are, not to see you for who, who we want you to be or who we assume that you were based on uh, what we saw from your followers, but for who you really are. God, we, we give you honor and we give you praise and we give you glory tonight. And we ask, uh, God, that in this place, this place in which you are lifted high, that you would visit us, that you would in your mercy toward us, that you would reveal yourself to us and let us see you clearly tonight. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, I uh, I don't have I have when I say I don't have a lot of scripture references. I don't have any scripture references that I'm going to throw up on the overhead because I'm going to move fast, and I have about 50 different uh, Bible verses that I'm going to be skipping between. Uh, so don't even bother trying to follow along. You can write write down notes if you need to, uh, but just just listen. And and I believe that with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna I'm gonna help to take you through the cross. And begin to show you some of the things uh, that were put on display. Now this is not necessarily even about what Jesus suffered. This is about what people saw while they watched him suffer. That's an important distinction to make. And I'll get back there later. Uh, first I want to begin uh, when, when Jesus leaves the city. Meaning, meaning when Jesus walks out of, of Jerusalem. He leaves the city after, after a trial. Or having uh, just been wrongly accused and publicly rejected by the people he came to save. The people that earlier that week were laying palm branches at his feet and crying, Hosanna. People that were, were identifying him as the Messiah that they'd been waiting for. As they were laying palm branches at his feet, it was just days later in which those same people were crying out, crucify him. We don't need him. Get rid of him. Now, uh, Luke chapter 23 says that at this time, a great multitude followed him. And, and, and it, it goes out of its way to say women who also mourned and lamented him. Uh, now, I, I want you to, to allow your imagination to go there for a minute. To imagine a great multitude of people, some of, some of whom are hurling accusations at him, some of whom are weeping and saying, we expected that this would be the Messiah we've been waiting for for so long. And, the, and these women, with, with everything in them, they're, they're, they're weeping and they're sobbing and they're, and they're undignified. That's the word I'm going to come back to a few times today. People are losing their minds. Jesus. That we remember. We remember last week when all of us were crying Hosanna to this guy. He came into the temple and began to minister. And we identified him as Yahweh in the flesh. Said that he was the Messiah. That God sent to save us from our oppressor. Our, our hopes for him were so high. But, but obviously, he's not who, who we thought he was. Obviously, we've been duped again. Obviously, we've been misled and deceived once again. And these women are mourning and lamenting him. And I want you to hear that for a minute. To really allow your imagination to go there. To, 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 to go to the sound of a multitude of women weeping and sobbing. Maybe praying an Aramaic arguing with, with Roman guards asking that that they would please have mercy on him. He's a holy man. Pleading. And nothing is stopping. The procession is happening. And at this time I want you to, to see the Savior. As he's carrying the, the, the beam of the cross. Before uh, it's laid on a man named Siren, Simon. And at this point. At this point. Just to give you a clear picture. At this point he's been struck in the face repeatedly. By the chief priests and the elders. According to Matthew 26 verse 67. Uh, he, he's been spit on by the chief priests and the elders. He's been scourged or flogged by Pilate's soldiers. He's been beaten by Pilate's soldiers. He's been spit on by Pilate's soldiers. He's had a crown of thorns placed on his head and beaten down into his skull with a rod made of wood. Now he's had... Obviously there were other things that happened. Uh, they, they put a robe on him, uh, but they took that off. Because he wasn't really worthy of it. So I want you to, I want you to see what we're looking at right now. That this was, this was a man that had, he had blood in the spit of dozens of other men running down his face. 
He was being carried out a main road of the city. I'm sorry, he was being walked out a main road of the city. And so, so people were walking in to sell goods. People were walking in to, to buy things or to, to come into uh, 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 the, the, the marketplace. And they saw this man with blood dripping off of his face, having been, having been scourged or flogged. And we know, we know that, and we've, we've seen it in movies, right, the, the, with the cat of nine tails. And it actually says in Psalm 22 that all of his bones were, 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 were visible, that he could count all of his bones. It says in, uh, in the book of Isaiah that, uh, that they had ripped his beard out of his face. So I want you to see that, that already, when, when we begin, Jesus is already just a broken shell of a man. Not this, not this revolutionary that people pegged him as. Not this, not this one that had, that had a, a, a mounted insurrection against the Roman people. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees had said he'd done. Just a broken, bleeding man covered in the spit of other men. Now I say this to you. Uh, uh, to show you that uh, that as, as as that he would have had the spit of dozens of other men dried on and dripping off of his face, having been mixed with the blood from the wounds and his head left from the crown of thorns they'd put there. His skin was in ribbons from the flogging he endured at the hands of Pilate's men, having been so severely shredded that, that, that like I said, Psalm 22 records that all his bones could be seen. Now it wasn't a far walk out to Golgotha. Maybe a quarter of a mile. But Jesus, unable to even complete the walk with the, the beam of his cross on his back, uh, they, they found a man named Simon the Cyrene, and they, they, they put it on him and made him carry the cross the rest of the way. It wouldn't have been far, maybe a few hundred yards. And they come up to a place called the place of the skull or, or Golgotha, which is, uh, which is just outside the eastern wall of Jerusalem. And I, I, I want you to understand, we know this place is the place at which Jesus died, but they did not. This place had no historical or spiritual relevance. This was just the place we kill criminals. It's not a special place. They didn't take Jesus to a place of honor. They didn't say, well, we're about to murder God's only son. They didn't say, this is the prophesied Messiah that we're about to kill, so let's take him to a special place to give him a great honor. They took him to the same place they killed all the criminals. The place of the skull. We know where we're going to take him. Now, history tells us that there were two grave sites near Golgotha. One was a cemetery in which the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was located. The Bible uh, goes out of its way to say that that was nearby. So Jesus was not carried far uh, it, to the tomb in which he was laid. And the other uh, burial site near Golgotha was a, a valley in which Roman soldiers would dump the bodies of criminals, leaving them to be eaten by birds or wild animals. There was no dignity, no special funeral. There was no uh, religious ceremony for men that they murdered. They just, they thought these guys are criminals. We're better off without them. Let's just get rid of their bodies. Let's throw their bodies behind this hill and let the birds or the animals take them. And like I said just a minute ago, it was, it, Golgotha was next to one of the main roads into the city. So Jesus, between two criminals... Is dying, and it's 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 not a place that's set apart. It's not a place that's special. It's not a, a place that was uh, in in any way expressly uh, spiritual or religious or even important. It was just the place that we kill criminals. A place that maybe, if anybody gave it any thought, would have thought, "Well, I hope I never end up there." So 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 there we see the Son of God stripped naked. And slowly bleeding to death with his hands and feet nailed to a cross. And he's hung up to die between two thieves. And then he says, when they hang him up there, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now get this. Listen, I'm, I'm going fast because I really want to give you an opportunity to respond to this. Uh, and then get this. He just hangs there. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then, 
No angels come to minister to him. The lightning doesn't start flashing in the sky. The voice of God doesn't appear to suddenly show up at the last minute and save him from this suffering. He just hangs there. There's no music, no dramatic camera angles. No, the, the one uh, the disciples have been convinced would lead their revolution is dying. And it seems that there is nothing to be done to stop it. But his followers, those who said, Jesus, we'll follow you anywhere. The, one, the ones that said, we will lay our lives down for you. We're not afraid. Let's do it, Jesus. We're behind you all the way. The Gospels record that all of them stood at a distance and watched because they were too afraid to get close to him. It says specifically all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching. So that multitude, those people that expected that Jesus was the son of God, that he was going to be the one to, to liberate us from, from the oppression that we've been under. They didn't even have the courage to come close to him while he was dying. Now the Bible talks about John having an, uh, an interaction with him. Uh, John and, and, and uh, also Mary Magdalene and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. It says that they came close to him. But there's no record of anybody else being even remotely close to him. That Maybe they were within eye shot. Maybe they could see him because he was up on a hill, but they didn't want to get too close. Because the Lord knows what might have happened to them had they done so. In fact, in fact, there's not a single recorded word in scripture from any one of his followers to him. Jesus for three years had been pouring his life out for these people. Giving them everything, giving them, giving them wisdom and insight and authority and, and giving them a purpose and a plan and an identity. Giving them a union with the Father. He poured his life out for these people. And these were the same people that confessed they would follow him anywhere. And hanging on the cross, not one word from them. Not one of them stands there and says, Jesus, I still believe in you. Not one of them says, Jesus, this is unjust, and we're going to continue your ministry no matter what. Not one of them comes up and says, Jesus, we're with you, and we love you. Where's the extravagant worship then? You don't see anybody breaking boxes of perfume over him then? You don't see anybody washing his feet then? Nothing. Silence from his disciples. But his accusers aren't silent, are they? They have plenty to say. It says, because, because they hung him up by the side of the road, it says, those who passed by. Not those who had gone to see him die. Those that, that wanted to see the, the, the one that called himself the Messiah. Those that were passing by. We have other places to go, Jesus. But while we're walking by, we just want to point out that you are not who you said you were. It says, those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Now again, this was on the side of a very high, high traffic road into the city. And people knew Jesus. People knew what Jesus teach or what Jesus taught. And these people that, that were walking by him, even, even people that hadn't followed him out there, that didn't, that didn't care about him enough to consider themselves a follower of Jesus, they still knew who he was. They saw that sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And they say, oh yeah, we've heard about this man. Going from town to town performing miracles and casting out demons and healing the sick. Yeah, we've heard about him. I guess that he's not who he said he was. But although he was probably unrecognizable physically at this point. They could still read the sign. Hung above his head. 
And now they knew that he'd failed. And he'd been exposed as the fraud that he had been all along. Because after all, right, we trust the justice system. Because after all, he'd been put on trial and found guilty. Because after all, he, he must have, 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 have bore false witness. He must have, have been the blasphemer that everybody said he did. Because the priests said that's who he was. Because we trust them, right? These are the people whose job it is that have been, have been assigned by Almighty God to, to help us discern the scriptures and see the Messiah when he comes. So if they say this man's a blasphemer, well then we trust them. Huh. So these people walking down the side of the road that see him. You know, they begin to do something really interesting and something that I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but something that I've preached a number of times. Uh, and, and they begin to echo a very familiar phrase to Jesus. They say, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Now, I want you to understand that's the same deceptive, manipulative phrase used by the accuser. Get it. Some of you theologians get it. In, in Matthew chapter 4, in which the devil says, if you are the son of God, then turn these, these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, then cast yourself down from the temple. Do you realize that? Word for word, the exact same phrase. If you are the son of God, then come down from that cross. Because obviously the son of God would never die like a sinner. Because we know the Son of God would never, would never endure such shame. We know that God would never allow anybody to suffer. We know it would never be hard or uncomfortable or shameful or dishonoring for somebody to follow God. And we know God better than that. So when we look at you, we know that you're not the Son of God. If you really were, you would come down from that cross. Friend, I just want to take a quick second to apply this practically to you. If the world cannot convince you or if the devil cannot convince you or keep you from becoming a son of God, he'll do his best to convince you what being a son of God should look like. I'll say that again. If he can't keep you from becoming a son of God, he'll do his best to try to convince you what being a son of God should look like. If you are a son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are a son of God, cast yourself off of the temple. If you are a son of God, come down from that cross. Because you have to prove to me that you are who you say you are. It doesn't have anything to do with obedience to God. It has everything to do with what people see of you. All right. That's a whole other sermon. I'm not going to go down that road. So they begin to echo this phrase that the enemy used uh, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Or even before the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When he said, if you are the son of God. Word for word. And, and also, in, in fulfillment of Psalm 22's prophecy regarding that moment, they began to quote directly from it. I was, I was talking earlier today, and I said that, uh, that I had taken my notes from the five uh, crucifixion accounts in Scripture. That being, uh, those being John 19, uh, Matthew 27, uh, what is it, Luke 23, and Mark 15, uh, and also Psalm 22. The five crucifixion accounts in Scripture. Um... So they begin to quote directly from Psalm 22. Word for word, when they say in Matthew 27, 43, he trusted in God, let him deliver him. Oh, you're a godly man. Well, look, I'll bet God will take care of you. If you're really who you say you are, Jesus, then God is going to come through and God is going to do what we think God should do. Because isn't, really isn't that the, 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 uh, the mindset of a carnal culture? I don't know how many times I've had sinners say to me, well, it doesn't matter if I continue in my sin because God is merciful, right? Your God is merciful. Your God loves people unconditionally. Then he would never send people to hell. Listen, you don't get to tell me what you think God should do. You don't get to tell God what you think God should do, friend. We have one God. We're lucky that he's a God that made a way by the blood of his son Jesus for us to be saved from the consequences of our sin. But you don't get to dictate the terms on which you receive salvation. You don't get it just because God is nice. God established a way. God was so loving that he made a way for you. 
You don't get whatever God you think is best. You don't get whatever makes the most sense to you logically. You get who God is. His name is Yahweh, and he is the founder of heaven and earth, the God that spoke life itself into existence, and you will answer to him someday. You guys still with me? So this is hard for me. I've never, I've never, I've been taught the cross like it's, I've been taught the cross as, as, as an academic subject and I've studied the cross as, you know, we know that the, the, the cross is, you know, the, the, the thing that we've been called to take up, right? We know that the cross is, is the place that we leave our sin. I don't know how many altar calls I've invited people to come to the cross and leave their sin behind. But I don't think I've ever, as a labor of love, began to just look at the cross and look at the dishonor and the shame and the suffering that he endured for, for my sake. So they begin to quote directly from Psalm 22. And they say, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him. That's Psalm 22, 8, for those of you taking, uh, taking notes. So the pastors by are mocking him and they're quoting Matthew chapter four, verse three, and they're quoting Psalm 22, verse eight. They're fulfilling prophecy. They are operating in the exact same scheme that the enemy did prior to the beginning of Jesus ministry. But ultimately, most people passing by probably didn't even notice three criminals dying by the side of the road. You know, I've, I've, I've heard people try to preach this up and say, all creation stopped and held its breath at the moment at which the Son of God breathed his last. But friend, I, I don't know if I could say that. I think that it should have, but I think most people didn't care. I think that, that people should have, have honored his faithfulness and have honored the sacrifice that he made, uh, but they just didn't. Most people had places to go and things to do, and they were too busy to, to care about this man who obviously had failed at his attempt to revolt against the, the rule of, of Rome. After all, it wasn't anything new to see men dying by the side of the road. And those men had been found guilty in a court and condemned to death, so they must have deserved the punishment they received. Because we trust the justice system. And then... I want to I help rectify some, some uh, issues that I think Hollywood has, has ingrained into Christian uh, thinking. And then, Jesus does something really wild. He hangs on the cross for six hours. Listen, the, the cross is not the climactic last half hour of a movie about the cross. He hung there for six hours. Can, can you imagine standing there looking at him just dying for six hours and thinking, you know, at, at first, maybe when you get out there, you think God is going to intervene. I believe heaven's going to open up and he's going to send a legion of angels to come and liberate his son to show all of these people that he really is the Messiah that we've been saying that he is. I was convinced that he's the Messiah. I believe it. And, and maybe these people standing at a distance too afraid to come close to him. Maybe they're back there praying, saying, God, deliver him. God, deliver him. God, deliver him. And then when nothing happens... After the first 45 minutes, maybe they begin to lose a little bit of steam and a little bit of hope. Maybe then they get a little bit discouraged after about an hour and a half. Maybe by about two and a half or three hours, they've given up praying and they're just hoping that they don't get put on trial next. And then hour four comes around. And they're still there and he's still bleeding on that cross. And then hour five, he hangs there for six hours dying, just dying. He wasn't teaching from the cross. He wasn't prophesying from the cross. He wasn't laughing in the face of the, 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 the Pharisees saying, ha ha, you were used by the devil to, to, to set me up for the redemption of the world. He just hung there and he just died. And then in the sixth hour, the sixth hour of the day, he was hung on the cross at about, the, the Bible says about the third hour. And then about three hours into his time on the cross, uh, the Bible says that, that it gets dark. Now, uh, as I was studying this, I found something really interesting. There was a, uh, 
a Greek historian named, I can't even begin to pronounce his name, Phlegon. Uh, uh, this Greek historian who wrote an extensive historical chronology in the year one, uh, 137 AD, uh, in which he drew from many of his predecessors uh, and contemporaries. So he kind of took uh, the history that many people uh, around the region had been writing over the last 200 years and compiled it into this one, uh, this one uh, work. And in that he wrote this. He said, in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, or... Uh, 33 AD, the year that Jesus died, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun. That's a direct quote. And that, and this is another quote, it became night in the sixth hour of the day so that the stars even appeared in the heavens. It didn't just, it wasn't cloudy. It got dark. So dark that this man, this secular historian records that the stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great uh, earthquake in uh, Bithynia, and, and many things and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Now, the earthquake was also recorded in Matthew uh, chapter twenty-seven, verse fifty-one. But I want to point this out to you: it could not have been a solar eclipse. And I know that there's a lot of people, even historians around the time, that said it was an eclipse. Uh, but to point it out to you, Passover occurs uh, during a full moon, and and solar eclipses cannot happen at the same time as a full moon. Uh, so as Jesus was hanging on the cross, it became night. He'd been hanging there for three hours and it, it wasn't a, a solar eclipse. It didn't just get cloudy. It was night out at about noon. And I want to rectify Listen, I know that we all have a picture of the cross in our mind. And when I picture the cross, I picture it being cloudy because I think that that captures the mood better. But I want to rectify that, uh, that sort of poetic um, license that we take while viewing and, and describing the cross and tell you it was dark out. And so I can only imagine that, uh, that the people that were trying to work, the Roman soldiers, would have lit torches. And so when I see Jesus hanging on this cross, bleeding fighting and gasping for breath, gargling on the, uh, on the mucus that's collecting in his lungs because he's been suffocating to death slowly for the last three hours. I see the backdrop of a night sky. I think it's scriptural. And I see the, the, the eerie light of the torches the Roman soldiers lit so that they could make sure these men were dying dancing and flickering off of his shredded skin. And there he hung. Much, much of the blood uh, maybe has now dried on his skin and the flies have begun to invade his open wounds, drawn in by the scent of festering animal flesh. Because of the, because of the light of of the sun has, has hidden itself from the earth. The Roman soldiers lit torches and danced, uh, torches that danced and flickered in the darkness, casting eerie shadows on the broken body of the Son of God. And there we stayed for three more hours. It's night out in the middle of the day, and nobody knows why, and nobody connects it with this dying liar, this blasphemer that, that not even the people he, he supposedly uh, came to rule over, honored him enough to keep him alive. So there he hung for three more hours, and then he began to speak. And he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, he quotes Psalm 22. And then it says immediately after that, then somebody filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Put, uh, put a, a sponge, uh, yeah, put the sponge on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And that's in Mark chapter 15 and Matthew 27. And then shortly after that, he cries out with a loud voice, Jesus on the cross, he cries out with a loud voice, three words that if you, if you would just give him your attention, they would change your life forever. He says, it is finished. That's about the best news in the world. And then he dies. He 
He just died. The, the gospel authors say he breathed his last or, or he took his last breath. And John says he, he, he gave up his spirit. Or he gave up the ghost. Now because of, of the position of his body on the cross, he would have only been able to take uh, very shallow breaths. In fact, uh, suffocation is the official cause of death uh, for most crucified men. Now because he'd, he'd been breathing in this way for the last six hours, because of the, uh, the, the, the extreme torment uh, that his body had, had undergone even prior to that, fluid would have begun to build up in his lungs to a point at which he would have uh, begun releasing something or a sound called a death rattle. For those of you that have ever been around a dying person or a person when they die, uh, you'll know that, that within a few hours of their death, their, their breathing changes as their lungs begin to, to fill with fluid. And it sounds like they're gargling their own mucus. I know that we like to think that Jesus had a, had a powerful voice that would have shaken the heart of every man in that place. But I want you to understand the reality of what was happening. He was dying. And people would have heard this, this death rattle. As, as, as the, 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 all the, the, the gospel authors make it a point to say he breathed his last. That would have been something they were familiar with. We know that sound. That's the sound of a dying man breathing his last breath. And I want you quickly, for just a moment, I want you to imagine the smell. So I know that we talk about how the cross looked. I've talked a little bit about how the cross sounded. We talk a lot about what the cross meant, but I want you to think for just a minute what it probably smelled like standing near the cross of Jesus. From the sponge dipped in sour wine, you would have been able to smell the, the bitter, yeasty smell of fermented grape juice. Of wine, the metallic smell of dried blood and festering wounds. You would have you would have been unable to ignore the smell carried on the breeze from just down in, in, in the valley of dozens, if not hundreds, of rotting corpses piled up near the place called Golgotha. And then after he died. After, after people die, uh, their, their, their body uh, involuntarily evacuates their bowels. So I want you to understand that if you would have been standing next to the cross, it would have smelled like alcohol mixed with dried blood, mixed with the smell of rotting corpses and human feces. And there was no music. Nobody's there preaching the gospel to you. There's no light show. He just died. The one we call the king of glory. We love singing songs about him. And we love preaching it up and having a good time because of what he did. But the one we call the king of glory hung there naked on that cross covered in the spit of other men with wine, blood, and his own defecation running down his legs. Dead. Now there's a reason I've gone into such depth today. It's the reason I've gone into such depth in my explanation of the shame and dishonor Christ suffered at the cross. And that is because I want to remind you of a statement that I'm sure you've all heard before. I know Damon says it regularly. The statement is this. Jesus did not go to the cross so you wouldn't have to. He went to the cross to show you how. How? 
Jesus did not endure that shame so that you would not have to. He endured it to show you how. Is it, could, I, could I call the band back up? I'm just, I have a little bit more to go, but uh, as, as you guys come up, listen, I, I want you to stay with me. And I want you to understand what you just saw. This is the, the cross. It's not, it's not a, a play. It's not a dramatization of what it may have been like. This is the biblical account of what the cross really was like. The scientific account of what the cross was really like. And I, I, for, 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 for so long, I looked at the cross and I said, thank God I don't have to deal with that. Thank God I don't have to suffer like that. Thank God that I'll never be put to shame like that. Thank God that I'll never be as, as publicly embarrassed or ridiculed as he was. But friend, I believe with all of my heart that, like I said, Jesus did not go to that cross so that you wouldn't have to. He didn't take your place there. He led you there. Jesus went to the cross to show you how. And for those of you that, that feel called to ministry... I want to challenge you tonight in this. A life of Christian ministry is a life of bearing the burdens of others. Just like Jesus did on that cross. Suffering for the sake of those he loved. It's not pretty and it's not comfortable. It's not noble or distinguished. It's dirty. It's painful. It's humiliating. But it is glorious. I said, it is glorious. Most of the time, it's, it's thankless and will not earn you the respect or admiration you probably think you deserve. Those for whom your heart burns will hurt you, abuse you, and dishonor you. And your service may leave them disappointed and expecting a better performance from you. But after all, we're not called to perform. We're called to obey. Everybody, would you just close your eyes in this place? Stand up to your feet and close your eyes. Whew. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. I want you to stay in that place of focus. I want you to, with your eyes closed, I want you to begin to see the cross. With the night sky as the backdrop and, and the stars in the sky flickering in the background. With strangers walking behind you on the road hurling accusations at just another dying convict just another dying criminal just another fraud of a savior that we finally exposed for the liar he really was I want you to see him there with the spit of other men dried on his face and the blood seeping from the wounds inflicted in his head by the crown of thorns. Having been dried and, 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 and crusted over his eyes and, and his mouth. Being able to count his ribs with his intestines literally falling out of his body. And he didn't have eyes like flames of fire while he was hanging on that cross. He didn't have a voice like rushing waters. You could hear the, the gurgling rattle of the fluid filling his lungs as he slowly suffocated to death. And then he died and there he sat with blood and feces dripping from his feet and running down his legs. No breath in his lungs. No truth on his lips. No dignity left. I want you to understand that what we are pursuing in ministry is not dignity. It's not dignified. We're not pursuing popularity. If the object of ministry is to be well liked, then Jesus failed miserably. The dishonor he suffered 
on that cross is that to which he's invited you. I'm not going to tell you that it's inevitable that you'll become rich or that you'll become famous. I can't tell you that it's inevitable that God is going to use you as a voice that awakens nations or touches a generation. I'm not going to tell you that you're ever going to have a multi-million dollar ministry or a highly sought after gift. But I'll tell you this, if you're going to say yes to ministry, if you're going to follow Jesus to the cross, I can guarantee you, you'll suffer for it. I can guarantee you, you will lose friends for it. I can guarantee you, you'll be dishonored and embarrassed and shamed by people that hate you for it. I can promise you that the people that your heart burns to see saved, the people that you so desperately desire to love rightly are the people that are going to hurt you the worst. And, and I invite you tonight to die to yourself so that Christ may live through you. Christ, the burden bearer, Christ, the servant of all, the one who made himself nothing so that the undeserving wretches around him might become something. That is the king that ought to be living through you. The one that poured his life out, both in life and in death, so that others might live. Can you see him on that cross? having been falsely accused and condemned to die, having done nothing wrong, but being hung up and publicly discredited and disgraced as a liar and a thief and a deceiver and a manipulator, as somebody that is not fit to live among decent human beings. Can I tell you, if any of you ever get the honor of dying a martyr, they will not kill you for being a Christian. They'll kill you for being a bigot and a hypocrite. They'll kill you for being judgmental and closed-minded and hateful. You will not get the honor of dying as a martyr. Neither did Jesus. He didn't get the honor of being killed as, as the Savior. He got killed as just another common criminal. That's the one we call king. That's the one we call Lord. That's the one we call master. And it's a yes that will guarantee our disgrace. It's a yes that will guarantee our discomfort. It's a yes that will guarantee our suffering and our sacrifice. But it's a yes that is so glorious. It's a yes to one that is so worthy, that is so beautiful, that is so incredible that it's all worth it. It's a life of bearing the burdens of those around you, even when they hurt you, even when they curse you, even when they reject you, even when they, when they revile you. So we're going to have some altar time here in just a minute. First, I want to invite, I'm, I'm going to give other people an opportunity to respond uh, in just a second. But first, I want to invite anybody in this room that feels like you said yet a conditional yes to the call of Christ. That you realize while looking at the cross tonight that, that your yes to Jesus was conditional upon, uh, upon his protection of you. Or your yes to Jesus was conditional upon your own comfort. You said, yeah, Jesus, I'll follow you because it's going to make me popular. It's going to get me well liked. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to keep me out of trouble. If there's anybody in this room, whether you're, whether you're a student at Christ for the Nations or not a, a student at Christ for the Nations, that, that you felt like you've been calling yourself a Christian, 
But you've not ever really said yes to the cross. You've not ever really said yes to, to be obedient to the call of God no matter what it means for you. No matter what it means for your reputation or your bank account or your comfort. If you've said a conditional yes to Jesus and his call to the cross... And tonight, you want to make it an unconditional one. And you say, Jesus, I will join you in suffering. I will join you in shame. I will join you in being an object of ridicule for the nations of the earth. I want you to slip out of your seat right now. Push past the people that are next to you. And I want you to come up to the, 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 the front of this room. There is no such thing as a conditional yes to the call of Christ. Listen, if somebody's pushing past you, be considerate. Let them go. coming. Come on. They're still coming. It was a Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And that's the invitation tonight. I can't tell you that you're going to get murdered for being a Christian. Listen, you might get rich and famous. But for your faithfulness to the call of God on your life, you will face ridicule. I believe God is going to put people in your path that are going to encourage you and challenge you and hold you up and bless you in it. But there will be those that as they're passing by, hurl insults and accusations at you and say, if you really are a son of God, then you would never have been in this position. If you really were a son of God, you wouldn't waste your money on investing in overseas missions. You wouldn't waste your time going to church and praying, or worshiping God. If you really were a Christian, you'd be, you would take care of your bank account to make sure that your family has nice clothes and a good car and a big house. And you wouldn't risk your job by laying hands on people that come into your, your workplace and seeing them recover. I think there's still, listen, I'm, I'm going to extend another invitation in just a second, but I think there are still people that you're realizing tonight that, that you never realized what the, the cross would cost you. You felt like people told you this was just going to be a fun Christian thing and it was going to make you feel like a, feel like a good person finally. It was going to get rid of your guilt and your shame and you were going to finally feel good about yourself, but you didn't realize that you were going to have to follow Jesus to the cross. You didn't realize that you were going to have to, to suffer disgrace for him. You didn't realize that you were going to have to do things that seemed completely insane to the rest of the world. If, if you need to deal with that tonight, the altar is still open for you. Come on, right now. I'm not concerned about your reputation. I think there was one more. Come on. Shh. Come on, man. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If I'm ever going to preach the gospel, if I'm ever going to be a successful evangelist, I'm not going to sell people on Jesus. I want to know that I want them to know exactly the price they're going to have to pay, but I want to tell them it's worth it. I want to know people. I want to let people know that they're going to have to give it all. Yes, they're going to lose friends for this. Yes, they're going to uh, lose popularity and social status for this. Yes, it's going to mess with your reputation. But friend, he is so worth it. He is that beautiful. He is that incredible. The call that he has in your life is that wonderful. One moment in his presence is so worth it. So now I want to extend a call. Thank you, Jesus. I want to extend a call with, 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 with people's hearts and eyes still focused on the cross the glorious dishonor of the cross. I want to extend a call. To those of you that'll stand up and say, I'm still in this thing. To those of you that'll stand up and say, I, I receive the cross for the joy set before me. Hallelujah. I receive the cross because I believe Jesus is worthy. 
those of you that have been called into ministry and you say, I know exactly what I'm going to have to pay and it's everything and I'm willing to do it. If that's you tonight and you're willing to say, I'm still in this thing, no matter what it costs, I want you to come up here right now, man. And we're going to, hallelujah, we're going to give Jesus the praise that he deserves for the sacrifice he made for us. We stand right now on behalf, hallelujah, on behalf of our generation as representatives of a new wave of ministers unlike anything this world has ever seen and we declare to a, a, a hurting and a dying world that there are those that will follow Jesus to the cross and he is worthy of our shame and he's worthy of our disgrace and he's worthy of our embarrassment because he's that good he's that glorious he's that beautiful he's that incredible so can you listen can you get this I want people, I want people that are watching online to see. For those of you even that are that are that are watching online, I want to challenge you tonight. I want you to understand that you are not alone if you choose to come to the cross. That there is a generation in the church that is stepping up right now that'll come with you every step of the way. That we've said yes to whatever it costs for the fame and the honor of our King and our Savior in the earth a generation that will stand in spite of the shame and the dishonor and the rejection and the embarrassment of the cross and say he's still worthy he's still worthy and the answer is yes oh hallelujah so listen we're just gonna we're just gonna exalt him tonight and we're gonna we're just gonna tell him that he's worthy in light of the harsh reality of of the price we're going to pay for his fame and his glory in the earth. We're going to tell him tonight that he is worthy together. Tonight we're going to join together. We're going to lift our voices to the one true king to tell him that he is so worth it all. That the cross is a small price to pay to have him. As he turns and says the cross was a small price to pay to have you. We worship you, Jesus. Even now, begin to just lift your voice in adoration of the one true king right now. Just begin to tell him that you love him. Begin to tell him that he's worthy. Begin to tell him that, uh, that, that he's worth every sacrifice we've made, every friend we've lost, every temptation and every storm we've weathered. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. We choose you, Jesus, over the ease of a, of a, of a self-centered life. We choose you, Jesus. the world. 